as I'm about to show you, we know historically that the document called the Sinaiticus was changed. You can't get around it. Something that was snow white became dark and stained all throughout 694 pages. But who would do something like that? Or, logically speaking, who had to have either done it or been in partnership with whoever did it? It's unbelievable, but I don't see another option. And it sheds a harsh light on my education and even some of my own assumptions. Want to hear what I learned? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. In my last video, Is Sinaiticus a Fake?, I showed you how sometime during the 1800s, the huge Codex, big book, that we call Codex Sinaiticus, was changed from white to stained and dark. Let's break that down a bit. I am indebted to researcher Stephen Avery once again for his painstaking research. Listen to this timeline. In 1884 to 1850, all of Sinaiticus, meaning the so-called Septuagint Old Testament, with embedded Apocrypha, and including the New Testament, plus the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, every bit of it was clearly white, witnessed as white, described as white. Two sections of it were taken away, ultimately, to the King of Saxony, that's in Leipzig in modern Germany. And anyone can see that the Codex Federico Augustanus, CFA for short, is white to this very day. Then Porfiry Uspensky of Russia saw what was left of it the next year and described it as white in 1845. Then he visited again in 1850. It was still white. He published that fact in his two books on his journeys published in 1856 and 1857. That covers 1844 to 1850, six or seven years. And maybe because Leipzig is right there in Germany, people saw the CFA, so white, and they thought the Sinaiticus, well, the whole Sinaiticus, was white as well. In 1910, the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, Bible in the Church, said, quote, The Sinaitic manuscript was wonderfully fine, snow-white parchment. And listen to this 1913 description by another writer, J.A. McClymont. Quote, Sinaiticus was rescued from oblivion by the famous critic Tischendorf and now lies in the library of St. Petersburg, that's Russia, it is written on snow white vellum, supposed to have been made from the skins of antelopes. So according to two authors, the Sinaiticus was what? Snow white. But there's just one problem. It wasn't. In point of fact, after 1859, it was actually dark. That is, after Tischendorf got hold of it. How do we know that? Since those later writers described it as Snow White. From Tischendorf himself. Listen, in 1862, Tischendorf described them as Surflava. That's a Latin word that means yellowed. Also in 1862, Tischendorf allowed another scholar, Tregellus, to examine Sinaiticus for three days. So if it were changed after that date, Tregellus would have known it. 1864, Frederick Scrivener, in his own book, A Full Collation of the Codex Sinaiticus with the Received Text of the New Testament, said, quote, The vellum leaves were now almost yellow in color. End quote. And in 1911, Hallen and Kearsop Lake photographed the Sinaiticus in color, so there was no hiding what they saw. They said, quote, the thicker leaves are inclined to a yellowish tint. So people who actually saw the big part of the Sinaiticus thought it was 
yellow. Those who saw it before Tischendorf had it or only saw the CFA in Germany said it was Snow White. And the CFA, which was quickly, 1844, sent to the King of Saxony in modern Germany, was and still is white. So why did people still think it was all white after Tischendorf published the Sinaiticus in 1862? My thought, people could see the CFA part in Germany. People could not see the rest all the way in Russia. People had no reason to doubt that the whole Sinaiticus looked the same, so whoever saw the Snow White CFA assumed it was all white, but those who saw the rest of the Sinaiticus that Tischendorf spent all that time with assumed it was all yellowed and dark with those stains. There were two sets of people writing about two colors of Sinaiticus at the same time. And nobody even noticed, because not until the last couple of years has anyone put all the known pieces of Sinaiticus together where we can see them with our own eyes. You can see. What does this tell us? There are only so many years between when we knew the Sinaiticus as a whole was white and when a large part of it became dark. 1884 to 1850, white. 1862, dark, but wait. Tischendorf got the big part of it in 1859. And remember, when he got the CFA, his story says he only got one third of what he saw. So if someone else had darkened it, Tischendorf would have known because it was part of the pages of the Bible he got in 1859. Then he could have cried foul. What are you doing destroying the most ancient text of the Bible? But he didn't. He had to have known that the Sinaiticus was actually snow white. He himself said he saw not just the 43 leaves, but another 86. Those were part of what he brought back from St. Catherine's Monastery in 1859. That means one of two things. One, it was darkened between 1850 and 59, and Tischendorf knew, but said nothing about it. Or two, it was darkened sometime after he got it in 1859, and he hoped no one would ever know it was white. So, either Tischendorf did it or he knew who did it and was an accomplice. Tischendorf doesn't sound too good right now, does he? But let's look at it from a totally different angle. How does God deal with hidden things? In Luke 8, 17, and a lot of other places, Jesus said, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Jesus also said in Matthew 10.27 What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And remember what Jesus thanked God for in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, and in Luke. Listen to Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. See, that's God's pattern. He reveals his truth to humble people, and then he wants everyone to know about it. Anyone studying Tischendorf will realize he was proud and loud and kowtowed to the Pope, even though he was a Protestant. It seems that Tischendorf had his own holy grail, so to speak, called the Codex Vaticanus. He spent years doing favors for Catholic leaders, so they would write letters to the Pope and say that Tischendorf was worthy to see it. 
Sinaiticus and Vaticanus have something in common. They were both allegedly under the care of monks or Catholics and kept hidden from the common Christians for centuries. Does that sound like the fulfillment of God's promise to preserve his words in hidden places? In secret? Away from the people for close to 2,000 years? And the only way they could get them is to kowtow to monks or Jesuits or do favors for the king or pope? That's something that never sounded right to me, not even when I was told all this in Bible college. And what was the result? In Luke chapter 8, a woman with a flow of blood tried to just grab the hem of Jesus' garment in the midst of a big crowd. She thought she was hidden as she asked in faith for God to heal her. Look at verse 47. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. See, the woman could not be hidden from God. The truth came out and she fell before Jesus and declared everything. It was awesome. I hope I can see the video in heaven. And what did Jesus say to her? Thy faith hath made thee whole. Let me ask you, did Tischendorf's alleged discovery bring him to his knees? Did Tischendorf fall on his face and from pure conviction before God spread the gospel and preach Christ crucified and salvation by grace through faith for the rest of his life out of his gratefulness for such a find? Nope. He was still proud. He was still sneaky. He, or someone he knew, darkened the Sinaiticus parts he had to make them look old. He lied about that, even if nothing else. He engaged in intrigue to borrow or buy or steal the manuscripts, unless, of course, he forged them himself. Then he's a liar and a counterfeiter and a con man. These are not the actions of a man of faith, and I cannot see God rewarding that with the discovery of the century. But, hey, that's just me. And it doesn't matter whether it was made by Alexandrian intellectuals in 325 to 350 or made from scratch in the 1800s. It doesn't bear the marks of something holy to God. It isn't based on faith. It doesn't produce faith. In fact, it spawns doubt. It doesn't lift up Christ. It lowers Christ. The God of the Sinaiticus didn't keep his promises, but our God did. And we have the proof with 400 plus years worth of testing. God's preserved words in English, the King James Bible. I am finally beginning to believe that Constantin Tischendorf did something to the text and never admitted it, nor did anyone else around him admit it. So it may have happened before any of them actually saw what he had done. All he had to do was not show the two parts together and discredit anyone who had seen them all before in 1859. And by the way, that's exactly what he did. And it worked until just a few years ago. But remember, if every textual critic and teacher and even preacher in the world told you the opposite, the truth I just showed you is now coming out. Don't be afraid, as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 26, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered, but that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience 
in the sight of God. I can't trust the Sinaiticus. But remember, if I cannot trust the Sinaiticus, then neither can I trust almost any Bible on the market. That is, except the King James or other preserved Bible. The more I know, the more I like. No, the more I love my King James. God bless you and have a wonderful day.